We have a confessional reading this morning. Um, question and answers 87 to 90 of the Catechism. I thought in connection with uh, the prepar preparatory form for the Lord's Supper, maybe it would be good to uh, consider repentance this morning and actually today. Uh, there will be a theme of that. This is page 888, if any wishes to follow. Can those be saved who do not turn to God from their ungrateful and unrepentant ways? By no means. Scripture tells us that no unchaste person, no idolater, adulterer, thief, no covetous person, no drunkard, slanderer, robber, or the like will inherit the kingdom of God. And what is involved in genuine repentance or conversion? Two things, the dying away of the old self and the rising to life of the new. And what is the dying away of the old self? To be genuinely sorry for sin and more and more to hate and run away from it. What is the rising to life of the new self? Wholehearted joy in God through Christ and a love and delight to live according to the will of God by doing every kind of good work. Our scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66, the first six verses. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me and where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. But on this one will I look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. He who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering as if he offers swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol. Just as they have chosen their own ways and their soul delights in their abominations, so I will choose their delusions and bring their fears on them because when I called, no one answered. When I spoke, they did not hear, but they did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I do not delight. Hear the word of the Lord, you who tremble at his word. Your brethren who hated you, who cast you out for my name's sake, said, let the Lord be glorified that we may see your joy, but they shall be ashamed. The sound of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, the voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemies. So this ends our scripture reading and our text is from the second half of verse two. On this one will I look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. And congregation beloved of the Lord Jesus Christ, we have just uh, read the preparatory form that speaks of the importance of repentance. We've just read from the catechism as well where we confess no one can be saved who does not repent of his sins. Are these things so? Does the Bible actually teach these things? Well, that is what we're gonna look at this morning you may have heard stories of Martin Luther, for example. When he read the word of God, he was overcome by his sin. And our question this morning is whether this has happened to you and whether it does happen to you. We're in a relationship with God. And as we know, in human relationships, sometimes you can become 
accustomed to each other. And sometimes even the people with whom you are closest, you don't treat with the respect that they ought to have. And this can, if this can happen in a human relationship, can it happen also in your relationship with God? This idea of trembling at God's word, that is key to what our text is about. We know that we're saved by grace, through faith, apart from our works, and yet it is necessary to repent of our sins, to turn and to do good works in thankfulness to God. According to this verse, these are the people that God regards. These are the ones that God looks to. And the way that God is looking here is not looking in judgment or looking with disfavor. It's obviously God looking with a face of blessing, a face that brings joy, a face that brings life, a face that brings forgiveness. So this will be our theme, God's face of blessing. And when God says, to this one, I will look, it implies that there are others to whom God will not look. So the way we're going to break this down is first to look at those from whom God withholds that face of blessing. And then secondly, those to whom God shows it, those he looks upon. And then the third point, very practically, how can we tell the difference? Sometimes things may be unclear. How can we clarify that? So there is a judgment that's described here. We read it in verse 6. The Lord who fully repays his enemies and further down, Verses 15 and 16, we didn't, we didn't read that. The Lord rendering his anger with fury, his rebuke with flames of fire. There is a kingdom promised in Isaiah 65 and 66 with great glories. Some are not going to enjoy it. They're going to experience judgment from God. Who are these people from whom God hides his face? Well, the book of Isaiah actually opens with a description. They are mentioned there in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 15. It says, these people, when they spread forth their hands in prayer to God, God will hide his eyes from them. He is not going to hear their prayers. He's not going to regard them with this face of blessing, which we're talking about. He says, even though you make many prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood. There's a connection between their actions and God's lack of favor towards them. They have oppressed their neighbors. They have perverted justice for profit. Isaiah 58 as well. God performs, uh, these people perform the religious observances. They say, we fasted and you do not see it speaking to God. And the reason is they perform their religious observances. Why? To justify oppressing their neighbors who are naked and hungry and poor instead of relieving them. And as you continue, we see that there is also a spiritual connection. It's not just outward actions that we see, but what goes on in their hearts, there is a weariness in worshiping God. They practice their religion as, as if they were doing God a favor, as if God were being profited by them coming, and they are getting tired of it because they are not getting the quid pro quo, they're not getting uh, the response back they are putting in effort towards God and they are not seeing God bless them the way that they want to. So this is who they are, just very simply. Now, that worship is described in verse 3 of our text. This is how they appear to God, how they come across to him. They are not 
off making offerings in humility and faith. And instead, God looks at it this way. He who kills a bull is as if he slays a man. So you offer this sacrifice that God ordained according to the law. And you think, well, God should be pleased now. I have killed this bull. What does God see? He sees the heart that is behind the offering. And why shouldn't he think that he is as one who slays a man when his hands are full of blood, when he has oppressed his neighbor, when he has shortened his life, or in some cases actually taken his life explicitly? He who sacrifices a lamb as if he breaks a dog's neck, this lamb, the symbol of purity, but what is the heart behind it? It is unclean. That is what a dog is, the unclean animal. The same, uh, he who offers a grain offering as if he offered swine's blood. Again, the pigs unclean in ceremonially before God. This was not pleasing to God. You can offer all of these offerings, but they do not have inherent value before God. And therefore God is not pleased if they are offered with an ungodly mind, with an ungodly spirit. What did people imagine? This is what pagan worship is, and it can be done in God's house as it can be done outside of it. Pagans offer to God, to their gods, believing that their gods will now do something for them. How does God introduce himself in this passage in Isaiah 66? He comes as the possessor of all things. There is nothing that you can give him. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build me? I have made all these things. What can you give God to earn something from him. This question, where is the house you'll build me, King David? We'll see, he had to learn, learn some lessons in his own life. King David wanted to build the house for God, you may remember. And God came to him and he said, you think you're gonna build me a house? I will build you a house. I'm gonna make a house from your lineage. You see, David, you don't provide for me. I provide for you. You don't buy my favor. You experience my favor. It comes by grace. And what we do is a weak reflection of what God does in his mercy. We can only reflect that glory that God sends to us the glory that God shows to us, the favor he shows to us. So he is the possessor of heaven and earth. Where is the sin offering going to come from? It's going to come from him. The atonement comes from him, and that is in Jesus Christ. In the context of Isaiah, Isaiah 53, it is Christ who will make his soul an offering for sin. It is not us. It is he who will justify many. It is he who will bear their iniquities. So God who sits on his throne, the Lord of heaven and earth, he is the one who has to provide for sinful man. And this puts the offerings of the wicked into perspective. They are offered in the wrong way. And we understand what Jesus is saying when he says, come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, you will find rest for your souls because he is gracious. He's the son of the Lord of heaven and earth. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He's able to provide what we need. So Christ also calls us Take my yoke upon you. I am meek. I am lowly in heart. And this is where we turn next because this is the contrast with those from whom God turns his face who are arrogant, who are oppressors, and who even have this view of God that 
they can do something for God and God is little less than what he ought to be. So, to whom will God look? And there are three phrases here in verse 2. One who is poor, one who is of a contrite spirit, one who trembles at God's word. Well, who are the poor? Think of the oppressors of their people. God is speaking a word of comfort to those who are oppressed in Israel. What do oppressors do? They don't make their neighbors rich. They make their neighbors poor in order to make life comfortable for themselves. In the book of Isaiah, God says to the wicked, they have the spoil of the poor in their houses. They're grinding the faces of the poor. They are taking away the right of the poor. They destroy the poor with lying words. So the poor are on the receiving end of this oppression and they haven't said, well, if you can't beat them, join them. They haven't said, well, I'm going to corrupt myself too. I'm going to try to get into that group because they are living the high life. They haven't taken the law into their own hands. They haven't taken revenge. They've committed their cause to God. The courts are corrupt. They've tried the courts. Now they commit their cause to God. This is who the poor are. So they are literally poor, but we're not talking about taking a vow of poverty. We're not talking about giving all your money away today. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who have been under the oppression of others, of God's people, and who have committed their cause to God. The poor show up over and over again in the Psalms. They will be saved. It is not because they are poor, it's because they are trusting in the Lord. Some quotes from the Psalms, they seek him, they cry to him, they call to him for mercy. The Lord is their refuge, they are righteous. So the poor, and you can understand now why Jesus also said, blessed are the poor, blessed are you who mourn now. And why Jesus also said it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because the rich, how did they get rich? Well, for some, it has been by exploitation. For some, their interest has not been in their life to come, but in living an easy life now, a comfortable life now, which they are willing to do at the expense of others, rather than looking in dependence to God. Now, you can be poor in spirit as a rich person, one who defends the right of the poor, who even helps the poor as they need it. That's not, Jesus didn't say it's impossible for a rich man. We should understand there are general categories here. Poor people are not by definition godly, but this is in a context and there's a generalization being spoken of. So the poor is trusting in God. He's interested in justice from God. He hasn't been overcome by evil. He wants to overcome evil with good. His trust is that the Lord will bring justice in his kingdom. And that really, this spiritual idea that's behind it, that takes us now to the contrite spirit. And as we move through this verse, we get closer and closer to that, um, the root that's behind it, the one who trembles at my word. What is it to be contrite in spirit? To be contrite is to be struck and wounded, and what is the spirit that is your inner being? You're not wounded because of the actions of others. These are wrongful actions done yourself. The poor person suffers 
because of what others have done to him. The contrite person suffers because he realizes he is sinful. This is that spiritual dimension that lies behind the poor who are trusting in God. And we can put the two together in Psalm 34 from which we sang, this poor man cried, the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. And it follows up later in the Psalm, the Lord is near to them that are of a broken heart. He saves such as have a contrite spirit because these are not a set of three different kinds of people. This is the same person in whom these things are found. It is the poor who is contrite in spirit. So the wicked, in that sacrificial system, he would bring his sacrifice and he would say, here is my sacrifice, God, now do me good. And what is the contrite spirit saying? He is saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He understood the meaning of his sacrifices. Those sacrifices in the Old Testament, what did they mean? It means there's a need to unload sin on someone else, someone who can bear the sin. And we know that's not bulls and goats. We know it's Jesus Christ. That is who God provided. But this is the question for this morning. As we appear before the Lord, what is motivating us? And do we come with our load of sin? And do we say, I have this sin. I need to be unburdened by this sin. I need to lay it on Jesus Christ. Because that's the difference between those from whom God hid his face and those to whom God showed it. And we can look at this relationship in King David. When Nathan said, you are the man, and David said, I sinned the Lord, I sinned against the Lord, he had been living that lifestyle of the rich and famous because he was able to commit sin and he was in this position of power where he could twist things to make it look a lot better for himself. He could do away with Bathsheba's husband. He had the power, he had the position, he could get away with it. He abused the poor. He was one of the oppressors at that point in his life. But when he acknowledged his sin, his heart was broken and he knew he could not just pull more animals out of the stable and give the offering. He had so many at his disposal. Is that what God wanted? And it wasn't. You don't desire sacrifice or I would give it. You don't delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. What were these offerings that God required in his word? To those who were rich, they'd taken from their poor neighbors, they were living in luxury. These offerings for God, they were small change for them. They were a luxury tax for them. But to God, what were they? They were repulsive those offerings, because they were not offered with a contrite spirit. Well, how does the spirit become contrite? And this is the last part of verse three here. The spirit becomes contrite when it knows it has broken God's law. Those who tremble at his word. <clears throat> We handle the word of God very often, don't we? And we have multiple copies of God's word. We may have it on our phones. We may have it in paper form, different places. We might have a copy in the car, at the office, different rooms in the house. We're reading it multiple times a day. We might sit down, have some personal 
Bible study time where we make ourselves comfortable. We come to church. We sit under the preaching of the word. We have Bible studies. We get together where we look at what God has to say. Are we becoming accustomed to the voice of God? We should understand that in Isaiah's day, the wicked loved to come and to be instructed. They loved to learn God's ways. In today's terms, we would say they faithfully came to church and they came to Bible studies and they were engaged. But they didn't tremble at God's word. Do you? They didn't treat the word as the word, verse 1 says, the word of one for whom the earth is just a footstool. They were faithful where they could easily obey. And then when there was a little bit of friction and it was harder for them, well, then nobody's perfect, right? that theology was very useful for them to defend themselves and to throw the book at other people. They could learn the loopholes of the law for themselves and they could hold others to account. If they truly honored the word of the Lord, if they truly trembled at the word of the Lord, then they wouldn't pick and choose the commandments that suit them try to work around it, find a workaround, they would have recognized what is God doing? God in his grace has redeemed a people for himself and he is transforming them through his word to conform them to his own image, what we call the image of Christ today. Transforming his people to become good, to become merciful, to become compassionate, to hear the cry of the poor and the needy, the orphan and the widow, to deliver those in bondage. If God's people saw themselves as these needy people to whom God had shown mercy, they would think this is the most wonderful thing, that God could be this way and that they could be transformed into the image of God, to be the same themselves. They did not see or should not have seen God's laws as a hindrance to life, as something that is curtailing their finances, that's curtailing the way that they want to live. God's word is teaching them how to keep in step with his spirit, how to walk with God, how to glorify God, how to be beautiful as God is beautiful. Well, that is not going to happen unless we know that the one of Isaiah 66, verse 1, that he is the one who is speaking. What happened when he revealed himself at Mount Sinai and he spoke to his people? We read it. The people trembled. They feared God. They asked for a mediator to speak with them. And you know what God said? Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Foreshadowing that this would not always be how God's people are. By the word of God, our sin is uncovered. And God calls us to repent of our sin, as hard as that is, to confess our sin, to find mercy from him. This is going to continue our whole lives. But as the Lord works with us, he teaches us how to walk humbly with him. This word of the Lord, we can think of Psalm 40. It's prophetically speaking of Christ, but in speaking of Christ, it speaks of those who are Christ's, who partake of his spirit, 
burnt offering, sin offering you did not require. Instead, I come to do your will, O God. Your law is in my heart. I tremble at your word. What men offer to God is not the point. And that's true also today. The point is not what men offer to God. What was pictured in what men offer to God is what God was providing to man. The Savior, Jesus Christ, what he had to offer them. Only Christ can forgive sin. Well, we're getting into the third point now, and that is knowing the difference. Because we can take this list now, one who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at his word, and we can start looking at this without context, and we can become confused. And in fact, there are some today, perhaps as individuals, also perhaps as churches who specialize in setting a bar that no man can ever reach. In interpreting a verse like this in that way, they will tell you, when you look back at your sin, look back at how you've lived, it's so full of sin, And then when you were sorry for your sin, you weren't sorry enough, really. If you knew God as you ought to know him, you would have been more sorry. You would have humbled yourself more. The feeling wouldn't have faded if you were truly godly. That feeling wouldn't fade. You can have this discussion with your own self sometimes. You don't need others to give it to you. These doubts can arise in your own mind. And rightly so, rightly so, because repentance, even repentance, is affected by our sin. Even our repentance is imperfect. And you can take it to the point where you start to question, is this repentance even genuine at all in yourself or in another? And what can happen is you try to fix yourself in this area before you go to God. And this is a bit like Martin Luther understanding he was a sinner and he sat in his cell and he whipped himself before he understood the gospel. What is verse two actually about? Is this what God is calling for in verse two? To constantly say, your repentance is not good enough, no matter how good it is, because it never will be perfect, will it? Is that what God is asking? First of all, let's understand What God says in verse 2 is a comfort and a promise to some of God's people who have undergone a lot of hardship. They've been oppressed by their neighbors. They've sought the courts. The courts have failed them. They have perverted justice. And they're crying out to God because they're living lives of suffering. And God says to them, I see you. I see you. You're trembling at my word. God is not making this promise that he will look to them so that nobody can be comforted by it. That is not what he is doing. What is the intent here? It's to distinguish these two classes of people. There are those who care about themselves and their own power, their own ability to twist things to their own advantage so they live comfortably. And there are those 
who live humbly before God. Although the word work of God is not complete in this life, there's a clear difference between the two. And what is the point of verse two? He who trembles at my word, who trembles at my word, what does God's word do? It doesn't just say the commandments. First commandment, second commandment, third commandment, fourth commandment. God's word is much more than that, is it not? We know the introduction. I'm the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, out of the house of bondage of our sin. The word of God at which we are to tremble is the word of your shepherd. It's the word of Jesus Christ. These people to whom God looks hear the voice of their shepherd and they tremble at the voice of their shepherd, not at those who oppress them, not at the voice of those who threaten and accuse them, not to the voice of their own doubts. They say his voice is supreme and I'm going to listen to him because he has good news for me. He says, come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. If any man thirst, let him come and drink. Come to the waters. Come buy wine, milk, bread, without money, without price. He who comes to me, I will in no way cast out. Do you tremble at his word? Because it's not just acknowledging your sin. It's also acknowledging who your Savior is and that he is greater than your sin. And so you can take your sins that you committed and your, the incompleteness of your repentance, and you can acknowledge them to him. You can take them to him. You could say, I'm not what I ought to be. Even when I confess my sin, I'm not what I ought to be. I know it. But I know you're my Savior. I know you've promised me grace. My repentance is imperfect, but it is true. It's genuine. I'm sorry I have this fountain of sin in me. Lord, will you overcome? Will you wash me? Will you cleanse me? Will you fill me with your spirit? And so you now do not need to think, go away and think a whole lot. You can take your sin right now, confess it to the Lord right now. The Lord has given a remedy. The remedy is Jesus Christ. And he doesn't just want you to use the remedy. He commands you to use the remedy. Use the remedy. For all who repent of their sin, you can have this assurance. To you, I will look. You don't want the alternative, that is for sure. Judgment. Judgment. The voice of the Lord who fully repays his enemies, says verse 6. You do not want that alternative. Do not want to be the enemy. But the good news we have from Romans 5, no enemy of Christ needs to remain an enemy of Christ. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, Romans 5.10. Christ came to turn enemies from whom he hides his face into 
those that he looks upon with favor and with grace. So by offering himself on the cross, countless, countless, countless enemies have been given redemption from judgment. Even those who are farthest from God, who have never known him, can receive a word of grace from this verse. Those who have used their power, their position, their abilities for themselves, and it's never been about God, it's only been about looking good in the church. It's only been about their comfort. Even they. For those who have been interested in the word of God, as a prosecuting attorney is interested in the law, even they can receive comfort from this verse. On this one I will look, on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. If you repent of your sin, take it to Jesus Christ. He will heal you of your sin. The promise in verse 2 is not an unreachable promise. Setting a bar that you can never reach. It's telling you this is how to live. Be willing to suffer loss for Christ's sake. Be the poor, whether the Lord makes you poor or not. That is up to him. Be contrite in spirit. Sorrow for your sins. And tremble at his word. Will the Lord look to you with a face of blessing? That is the question before you this morning. To all who repent, the answer is so clear from God's word. God's face of blessing will look on all who repent. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father in heaven, we are grateful that you don't cast us off at our first sin. That you bear long and patiently with us by your spirit, whom we sometimes grieve. We pray that you would continue with us, continue to bear with us, continue to speak good words to us, words of life, words of hope, words of favor, words of forgiveness, available only in Jesus Christ, because left to ourselves, we make a mess of things. We offend you, the Lord of heaven and earth. Please help us to become sensitized again to whose word this is in the scriptures, that it's the word of the living God, the maker of all things, to whom we all will give account before whose judgment seat we must all stand one day. And we do pray that you would humble all of our hearts and the hearts of many that we know who do not know you. We ask that uh, your gospel would be attractive, would be powerful in the lives of many, to bring them to know the grace that we experience, to be able to hear the good news that we hear Lord, let us walk worthy of the calling to which you've called us. Help us to love our neighbor. Help us to love you sincerely, not to come as if our offerings were anything, but to come as if you are a mighty God and a great Savior who has provided a wonderful salvation in Christ. We ask you to help us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let us sing, uh, stand and sing now, 51C, Psalm 51, Selection C, stanzas 1, 4, 5, and 7, 1, 4, 5, and 7. <laughs> 